Revelation chapter 2, commencing in verse 18. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and the perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they may commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no further burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I have also received authority from my Father. And I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira means continuing sacrifice. Continuing sacrifice in Greek. That's its derivation. Jesus begins with every church, before he reads the list of things he finds wrong with it, he begins addressing the things that are right with it. And such should our attitude be also. Now remember, these prophecies have a specific meaning for specific times in history. These seven churches literally existed in the first century, the end of the first century, beginning of the second. They correspond to various ages in history, and they teach about the seven kinds of ter- churches that can exist generally, but most specifically the kind that will exist in the last days, before Revelation proper, that is, Revelation chapter 4, commences. So hence, the curses and the blessings and the promises for this church, it applied to people in the first century, it applied to people during the Middle Ages, and it applies specifically to people in that church, most particularly in the last days. For instance, there was a tribulation in the Middle Ages. The things we think of today, like AIDS and so on, If you were to take AIDS and cancer and hepatitis B and all the other terrible diseases you can think of and put them together, they would not have killed nearly as many people as the bubonic plague. Most people who have not studied history in university or read history don't understand the impact of it, of of the bubonic plague, the black plague, the black death. Historically, sociologically, it was a phenomenon unprecedented in history for something like that to happen. It was nothing, history has never seen anything like the bubonic plague. Never has seen anything like the bubonic plague. Never. It totally decimated the population of Europe. There was not a single family that didn't have multiple deaths. Multiple. Some people, no one knows the exact percentages, but the percentages of people who, who, who died, it would be something, if one-third of the world's Jews died in the Holocaust, a substantially greater number of people died in the percentage-wise, died in the bubonic plague. Hence, the tribulation did transpire at that time in history. But it's also saying about the great tribulation that will come at the end of the world. Now, Jesus manifests himself (coughs) emphasizing different aspects of his apparition in chapter 1. Here, he's talking about those aspects of his apparition to do with judgment, the flame of fire and the burnished bronze. Those things have to do with judgment in biblical typology. We draw on this from the uh, construction of the tabernacle. The fire, the testing, the purifying with fire, and so on. He's looking for what's wrong, and his eyes are looking judgmentally on this church. And he commends what's gotten right. We're going to see the things that got right, but we're going to look at the heart of the problem, which is the woman Jezebel. If you did the Antichrist seminar, you realize what she is and who she is. She appears in Revelation, the wicked woman, 
And all of the wicked women in the Bible typify the woman Jezebel in some way. This is on the Antichrist, because that's in, in videos. Delilah, Queen Atlia, the woman Jezebel herself, Herodias, the wicked woman in Proverbs chapters 5 and chapter 7, the seductress. All of these wicked women typify the spirit of false religion that we call Jezebel in some way. And she is a seductress, a harlot, someone who is out to seduce God's servants, to commit acts of immorality, specifically to eat food sacrificed to idols. First of all, notice something. The things that are wrong in Thyatira are built on the things that begin to go wrong in Pergamum. We talked about Pergamum and its results. One of the things that happened in Pergamum was the works of the Nicolaitans. Nico suppression of the laite, a priestly class coming back, setting themselves over the people, apart from the people. Not even a class of servants, but almost a class of religious aristocracy, similar to the Pharisees of, of the times of Jesus. Only a Christianized version of the same phenomenon. Jesus hated the work for the Nicolaitans. Now we have to understand something. Right from the beginning, people were trying to get in and do things that were not of God. The woman was always there trying to seduce God's people as she was in the Old Testament. But when the apostles were around, she didn't get too far for too long. In the pre-Nicene church, there were people who followed the teachings of the apostles fairly accurately, such as Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, and they also prevented the woman from getting too far for too long. But about the time when Constantine makes Christendom the religion of the state, that begins to change. It begins to change for the worse. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul tells the believers, the mystery of iniquity already worketh. It's already there. The spirit of seduction was already around in the times of the apostles. But it becomes amplified, and then it becomes re-amplified again in the last days specifically, mushrooming. We talked about, when we studied Pergamum, what happened with Constantine when he makes Christendom the religion of the state. As emperor, he was the head of the pantheon of Rome, and his title was Pontificus Maximus, the pontiff. That title was passed on to the medieval papacy, to the pope, and now the pope is the pontiff, the head of the pantheon. Going into the pantheon and changing the names and the legacies and the legends of the Greco-Roman folk gods and bringing them into a, a, a Christian heading or a Christian label, most significant of this is what happened with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Great is Artemis, great is Diana of Ephesus. This causes a riot when Paul contests the worship of Diana or Artemis. Today in South America, the Philippines, the same thing happens. You have these tremendous evangelical revivals happening in, in the poorer Catholic countries. And there's nothing that stirs up the Roman people, the Roman Catholic people, more than the agitation they experience when they think Mary's being offended. You understand? But of course it's not Mary. It's Minerva. It's Diana. It's Artemis. And you can see these things in the Vatican Museum. It's striking. You can see the Madonnas and the statues of Mary from different periods of history. In the same, there's five museums in the, in the Vatican. There are five. You can see <laughs> it's exactly the continuity of Artemis worship and, and, and the female cult deities and so on, the fertility goddesses, etc. It's exactly. This came about as a result of something called, in part, Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon. The Holy Spirit is phased out. He becomes an understated, underrecognized member of the Godhead. But concerning Mary, something else happened. Because Jesus was God, and because man is separated from God because of our sin, there must be an intermediary now, not simply between God and man, but between man and Jesus. Now the Bible teaches that Jesus was God who became a man, to be that intermediary, that intercessor. And because the role of the Holy Spirit is suppressed, we've got to get somebody else to fill that role. Hence, the cult of Mary begins developing. In time, they came to say, Mary is the co-redeemer. Mary is the co-mediatrix. She is the co-redemptress. 
she participated in the atonement and the redemption. However, for her to be co-redeemer and co-redemptress, she had to be conceived without sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they began coming up with doctrines such as the Immaculate Conception. Now, when witnessing to Roman Catholics, you should be aware of the fact that they need to be made aware of the fact that their two most important theologians, Augustine of Hippo and Thomas Aquinas, both denied the Immaculate Conception. Most Catholics don't know that, but their two greatest theological thinkers both denied it. So did many popes, most popes. didn't become an official doctrine until relatively recently. Do you see what I'm saying? So Mary begins to take this position. Jesus is denigrated. Now this is the exact nature of the woman Jezebel, the female spirit of false religion. Mary was the greatest woman who ever lived, hands down. The scripture says that the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty man of God, told her that she's blessed among women. There's no question. But Mary said, my soul rejoices in God my Savior. She says she needed a Savior. The Roman church had to come along and say, no, she didn't. Theotokos, Mary the mother of God. No place of that in Scripture. Most Roman Catholic people you, be, you will meet will probably believe it's in the Bible that Jesus said, when you honor my mother, you're honoring me. Now, it's not in the Bible, but most Catholic people are led to believe it is. It goes back to this period. And because she becomes a mother figure, and she's the way to get to God, Mary, instead of Jesus, you have to be very sensitive when you talk to Roman Catholic people about it. The most effective way is to look at Mary herself. She says she needed a Savior. Who am I going to believe? Mary bought a sin offering when Jesus was born. Deal with it in that aspect. So you had the Nicolaitanism paving the way, and then you had the deeds of Constantine making the Bishop of Rome, the new pontiff, and the gods of the pantheon being called saints. God of gift-giving, Saint Nicholas, pagan god of love, Saint Valentine, etc. But then there was something else. We talked about Gnosticism. It's not what the Bible says that's important. It's what the person who has the Gnosos, the mystical subjective revelation, says about the Bible that's important. It's in all, all false cults in some way. Nonetheless, its origins are Gnostic. Now, in Roman Catholicism, Gnosticism is central in its pure sense. Most people who are Gnostics, they claim their leader, the person with the Gnostos, has it because of some kind of descent. With Roman Catholicism, it's the claim to be the heir or the successor of Peter. This form of Gnosticism in the Roman Catholic Church, the way they interpret the Bible, is called sensus senior in Latin, sensus plenty, or the fullest sense. And only the person who has the Nassos, only the Pope, as the heir of Peter, can properly interpret the Bible. In other words, for your hermeneutics to be right, your ecclesiology has to be right. In other words, to understand the Bible, you have to be under the Pope. Otherwise, you're under deception. They have a constitution called Lumines Gentes, or Luminum Gentum. That's their constitution. In this constitution, it specifies this, that only the church can interpret the Bible through something called the magisterium. What the magisterium comes down to, it's the hierarchy of the church under the headship of the Pope, but he has the final word. Hence, even though their greatest theologians deny the Immaculate Conception, once the Pope says it, he has the Nasso, she can't argue with him, there's no higher authority. See what I'm saying? So, the Gnosticism that comes in in Pergamum, the Nicolaitanism that comes in in Pergamum, that lays the groundwork for what happens in Thyatira. Now remember, even before Satan began to paganize Christendom, he Judaized it. The Epistle to the Galatians. His first attempts were to Judaize it. A lot could be said about the paganistic origins of much of Roman Catholic belief. I will quote from Cardinal John Henry Newman, the greatest Roman Catholic theological thinker Great Britain has ever produced. They want to have him canonized the saint. Cardinal Newman said this in his treatise, The Development of the Christian Religion. Read it for yourself. At least 70% of the rites, rituals, customs, and traditions of Roman Catholicism are of pagan origin. 
In Jerusalem, we have the Evangelical Institute of Holy Land Studies. And then we have another place called the Pontifical Institute of Holy Land Studies. I've been there and talked to Jesuit scholars. You confront them with the evidence. They will not deny it. A good book to read is Alexander Hislop's classic, The Two Babylons. And he, he uses archaeology and anthropology to demonstrate the exact pagan origins of these things. I just wish someone would produce a more modern version of it. It's tedious to read, but well worth reading. Then we get, again, to this idea of Judaism. Satan wanted to Judaize the church first. That's how he tried to undermine the gospel to begin with. That's what Paul's getting at in Galatians. That's a large part of what the epistle to the Hebrews is getting at, warning Jews about regressing into the bondage of Old Testament religion. Instead of a priesthood of all believers, which is what the New Testament teaches, no, we go back to a special priesthood like the Levites in the Old Testament. The Roman Catholics believe their priests have special powers that other people don't have to forgive sins and to transubstantiate. They put back the Levitical priesthood. You see what I'm saying? It's Judaization. The second thing that happens is this. Instead of the church being a dynamic tabernacle, a dynamic temple, each one of us, a temple of the Holy Spirit that's dynamic, it's not static, it moves. No, on the altar, there it is, the tabernacle, the box, that's where he lives. Hello, is anybody in there? That's what they believe. So it's like the Holy of Holies. The Kodesh Kodeshim in Hebrew, or as Catholics would call it, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Put the tabernacle back, he's in one place, he's fixed. I once was uh, giving out tracts to Roman Catholics with my friend in Battersea Park when they had this big Mary thing, and uh, they had the benediction where the Cardinal Hume came in, in limousine with the monstrance. In other words, as far as they were concerned, Jesus Christ just arrived in a Mercedes limo. <laughs> You think he would have at least had a police escort. <laughs> After all, he's God. This is what it comes to. So, instead of having a dynamic tabernacle, you get a static one. Just like Judaism. It puts Judaism back. Okay? Now, it goes beyond that. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. In Hebrew, to make a covenant, we say lachtoch brit, to cut a covenant. I will cut a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. It shall be different. In Jeremiah's day, what was happening was this. People thought they were members of the state church, so therefore they were in a covenant relationship with God simply because they were in the state religion through circumcision. Jeremiah says, <clears throat> this is going to end. There's going to be a new covenant and God's going to write it on people's hearts individually. It's not going to be a national covenant. Paul explains this in Romans. They're not all Israel who say they're Israel. That's what Jesus says. They say they are Jews but are not Jews. They may be Jews culturally or genetically <clears throat> But they're not Jews spiritually. Romans 11 says Jews who reject Jesus get cut off from their own olive tree. In a spiritual sense, the same as non-Jews who accept him are grafted in. To so make a new covenant with this idea where people think that they're in a relationship with God because they're in the state church, that won't happen anymore. John the Baptist is getting at the same thing. He tells the Pharisees, you think you're special, God could raise Abraham's children up from these stones. This is all going out the window, as Jeremiah predicted the very things that Jesus dies to get rid of, they begin putting back. Do you see what's happened? So the next thing he does is he makes it a state church. And instead of people being baptized on profession of faith in Jesus, they begin baptizing the babies. Same as circumcision and making the national covenant back on the national state religion. You see what I'm saying? And you see the results. You see the results today of this kind of thinking, Erastianism, where it becomes an institution of the state. It's called Erastianism. So, the roots of what happened in Thyatira are based on what happened previous to it. Particularly Nicolaitanism, Gnosticism, and above all, Judaism. What happens when the church gets Judaized? The Mass. The priest is coming in offering what they call the sacrifice of the Mass. In which they will tell you Jesus dies again. 
it is a representation of the actual sacrifice of Calvary. It's vague and mystical, but they say the bread and wine becomes transubstantiated, becomes Jesus. It's worship. It should be worshipped. Roman Catholic documents, their catechisms, teach it to be worshipped. And then what amounts to an act of cannibalism is carried out. They eat it. That's what happens. It's utterly cannibalistic. That's the pagan aspect. But first of all, it's Judaized. You see what I'm saying? Jesus dies once and for all to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. What happens? No. He has to die again and again and again. The Mass is a central doctrine, probably the central doctrine of Roman Catholicism. And it fundamentally denies the Gospel, as the New Testament teaches it. It's a fundamental denial of the completed work of Jesus on the cross. Read their own literature. It's the same sacrifice he has to die again. Things begin to go from bad to worse. Along comes Augustine. Augustine comes along and he tries to Platonize Christendom, to make it Platonic, to make it acceptable to people with the Greek and Greco-Roman worldview. And he does that. He writes things called the city of God when Rome is destroyed finally. He says the kingdom of God lasts forever. But he writes something called the Confessions. And in it, he begins to lay the groundwork, the groundwork for what happened in the Middle Ages. Now, you have to realize, for over 1,000 years, Roman Catholicism reigned. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would be like, all you have to do is look at what a Roman Catholic world was like for over 1,000 years. If you want to know what the Roman Catholic Church would do in the world, if it had its way in the world, and could do anything it wanted in the world, all you have to do is look at what it did. The Byzantine and even the Islamic empires had their golden age, while under Roman Catholicism, Europe went into the Dark Ages. All of Roman Catholic doctrine was based on one particular type of struggle, the Platonists fighting against and reacting against the Aristotelians, and the Aristotelians fighting against and reacting against the Platonists. Now, in the Roman Catholic Constitution, Luminum Gentum, it comes to this. There's something called Sempre Eden. Its origins are in the Islamic world. In Islam, it's called Ijtahad. Later on, when the Crusades begin coming back from the East, they begin bringing these Islamic and Byzantine influences back into Western Europe. And Greco-Roman learning and culture is rediscovered. That's the Renaissance. You see, look at a Moorish arch, and then you look at Gothic architectures with the flying buttresses. All these things came from the Muslim world. The Muslims were far ahead in things like architecture, Literature, medicine, mathematics, science, philosophy, well ahead. Well ahead. European Jews were considered primitive. It was the Sephardic Jews in Spain and North Africa who were the learned ones. Today it's basically more or less the opposite. They were having their golden age. The popes wanted to control spice trades to the east. The economy of the west depended much on spice trades during the agricultural economy from the Middle East and as far away as India much the same as the economy of the West depends so heavily on oil from the Middle East today. So they come back and they bring these Islamic influences. I remember I was in Morocco and uh, I, I was shocked. I'd never been to the Muslim world before. I saw these little Arab girls dressed in white gowns that looked exactly like Roman Catholic First Communion, counting prayers on beads. After I became a Christian and I read Hislop's book and I saw these things were copied from Hindus and Muslims, I was shocked. Now I know where they got this stuff. So it was, these Eastern influences begin coming into Roman Catholicism, including Ijtihad. Ijtihad says in Islam you have Sharia and Din. Sharia and Din, religious law and religious, a religious codification of Koran and things de derived from it. And once something is determined to be legally binding in Islam, in Sharia and Din, and Din, 
The principle of Ijtihad takes over. It can't be changed. This comes into Roman Catholicism, and they say, sempre eden, always the same. So once you have a doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church, once it becomes officially proclaimed through the process known as being ex cathedra from the chair of Peter, it can't be changed. Now we find people today saying that the Roman Catholic Church changed with the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council documents all affirm the Council of Trent in the, Middle, in, in the Counter-Reformation. They can't change the essential doctrines. They can change the mass going from being in Latin into English or French or the vernacular. They can change the outer packaging. But as I raised a few eyebrows in, in Bible college when they asked me, what do you think of the Roman Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council? And I told them bluntly, it's like an old part with a new dress. But when you lift it up, you're still wearing the same knickers underneath you've had on for the last 2,000 years. <laughs> they cannot change. Sempre Eden. Ijtahad. It has to be that way. The principle of the Bible college where I studied described it as this. He said it's like someone getting a car, and an automobile, and they put more and more accessories on it. And the thing becomes so heavy it can't move or, or be dri driven. Yet they put on more accessories and more accessories and they can't take anything off it. So the whole thing looks ridiculous, doesn't drive well, and doesn't go anywhere. But they can't remove anything because of Sempre Eden. You see what I'm saying? Now the book of Jeremiah chapter 51 tells us directly this. Babylon cannot be healed. Babylon cannot be healed. Sempre Eden fulfills that prophecy. All of these false religions, again, come from Babylon with, with Nimrod and so on. They find their way through Pergamum, the city of Asia Minor, into Greco-Roman civilization, and from there into Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, Freemasonry, etc. Now a whole thing begins developing. They have to add this and add this and add this, and they can't take anything away. So you've got Aristotelians saying this, and then you've got Platonists saying this. Things that are mutually exclusive, but once they become integrated into the body of doctrine, the canon, you can't take it off. Things begin going wrong. Things begin going wrong, and people try to do something about it. Pretty soon, the established church begins murdering true Christians. One of the first major true Christians to be martyred was a bishop in Iberia whose name was Priscillian. He was the first person, first major figure martyred for his faith by the so-called church. The papacy then begins to develop. Now, Roman Catholicism basically comes to this. Institutionally, it was begun by Constantine the Great. Theologically, it was begun by Augustine, I'm sorry, yes, by Augustine, and by the people who influenced Augustine, particularly Cyprian, who was the sacramentalist, Cyprian of Carthage, we talked about him, and Ambrose, who began getting into this political thing of the, of the church as a political power and having political rights and so on, to, to carry out certain things, and the emperor had to be subjected to it and so on, if he was a Christian. That's how it begins doctrinally. Augustine and those who influenced him, institutionally, begins by Constantine. The papacy begins most likely with Gregory I, known as Gregory the Great. Now, in Ephesians, we read about Jesus being the cornerstone and the apostles and prophets being the foundation. They are the foundation of biblical Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church has something called the Fathers. And strikingly, many Protestants hold to it. That was another failure of the Reformation, as we'll see. The Reformers didn't go back to the Word of God. They went back to Augustine and to the Fathers, who began getting it wrong to begin with. The four main Fathers, the post-Nicene Fathers, after the Council of Nicaea, were Augustine, Gregory I, Jerome, who translated the Vulgate, the Bible into Latin, and Ambrose the mentor of Augustine. They begin it. Once again, when the Crusades came back, they saw the commemoration of the Battle of Kobala by Shia Muslims who would mutilate themselves and flagellate themselves and flagellate each other to commemorate the martyrdom of Muhammad's grandson, Ali, at the Battle of Kobala in the 8th century in Iraq. This comes back, along with the beads, 
And little girls with the white gowns, and this becomes integrated into the body of doctrine. So the, the monk, nuns and monks begin fl- flogging each other and flagellating each other, and flagellating them, this kind of thing. Crazy. Word. Now the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was flogged for our sins. You see what I'm saying? The mystery already worketh. They get further and further away from the Bible into a work righteousness. And some of the works were crazy. The worst of these became the development of the doctrine of indulgences. During the Renaissance, they needed a way to get the money to build all of these things. Basilicas, cathedrals, etc. Oh, your poor mother, she's in purgatory. Don't you want to get her out? There was one guy going around named Petzl, and he said, when a coin into the box rings, from purgatory, your soul springs. And that's how they built these things. That's how they built these great cathedrals of, of the Renaissance. Just merchandising and preying on people's fears to this totally unbiblical doctrine. Now, something happened in the early Middle Ages. Something happened. The church got more worldly, and a movement of monasticism began in North Africa. And it was basically people realizing they wanted to escape the corruption and materialism of the established church, so they began forming these communities. Not monks as monks became, that began with Benedict, but they were just communities of of people. Now a lot of these began taking on paganistic influences. For instance, the Vestal Virgins of pagan Rome, the convent comes from that tradition. Nonetheless, a lot of monasticism began with good intentions. But the place where it blossomed the best was in the British Isles with the Celtic Church. We can read the Confessions of Patrick and the other major work. He wrote a letter to Desidrus or something. I've read it a few times. You see that he knew nothing of Mary or superstitions or purgatories or any of this. The Vikings invaded continental Europe, totally obliterating Christianity in the entirety of Western and Central Europe. Only Southern Italy was basically spared from the Viking invasions. Irish monks, following Patrick's successes, like Cullum Kill in the north of Ireland in Donegal, began sending missionaries to the Isle of Iona in Scotland. The leader there became was someone called Minion. And to Cornwall in England. St. Ives, St. Uni, St. Earth, these places in Cornwall are named after them. They were true believers who began re-evangelizing. They re-evangelized continental Europe, Boniface, to the Germans. They went all the way down to Lake Constance, the Bodensee in, in Germany, in Switzerland. Tremendous church. Not doctrinally perfect, but certainly Christian and Bible-based. They had their own translation of the New Testament of the Gospels called the Book of Kells. That was their belief. When all the manuscripts of the Bible were burned by the Vikings in the West, and by the Muslims in the East, well, Irish monks copied the greatest body of manuscripts we have from that period. They preserved our Bible as we have it. At least most of the manuscript records was the Irish. They have a wonderful missionary tradition. In time, however, someone named Augustine, not the Augustine of Hippo, but another Augustine, was sent by the Pope to try to Catholicize, papalize the Celtic Church. He didn't succeed, but in time, through political connivances, the Celtic Church at a place called Whitby in the north of England, Cuthbert and Ethelbert and all these strange people, some of them were very worldly people, and even the church admitted they were worldly people, in time acquiesced. The Irish continued to hold out to the Book of Kells and the traditions they got from Patrick and Cullum Kill, until Pope Adrian IV threatened to excommunicate Henry II, Henry II was a Norman. He was not English. And the Pope said, if you do not invade Ireland and put an end to the Celtic Church, I'm going to excommunicate you. You try telling an Irish Catholic the way that the English got involved in their country and invaded it to begin with was because the Pope sent them to put an end to biblical Christianity. (laughs) Try telling them that. They don't know. But that's how it began. That's how it began. Nonetheless, let's continue. In 1250, you have the Fourth Lateran Council under Pope Innocent III. What was innocent about him, I don't know. But he begins getting into auricular confessions and transubstantiation even further. 
he gets into the transubstantiation doctrines. So this is what Jesus is talking about, food sacrificed unto idols. We have an Aramaic prayer and a Sephardic Passover Haggadah. It's the prayer Jesus would have said at the Last Supper. We know that because it's Aramaic. And it uses the language of analogy. This is like the bread our fathers ate in the wilderness. When you understand what Jesus was doing in the Last Supper, and when you understand what he's saying in John 6 and in the Last Supper, it's impossible to come up with the doctrine of transubstantiation. It's only when you take a Jewish Passover and turn it into a Babylonian McDonald's or something that you can come up with those doctrines. When you look at it as a Seder meal, you cannot arrive at the doctrine of transubstantiation. It is a memorial. It is a commemoration. Do this in remembrance of me. That's exactly what the Passover is about. At this time, a very dynamic group of believers begin evangelizing. They were called the Waldensians. Simple people, forced, forced to live in Piedmont and in the higher Alps in, in northern Italy. They watched their children die of exposure and hunger because as soon as they came down, the papal armies would exterminate them. These people were noble, gospel-believing, gospel-preaching people, sending missionaries all over the place. There was never a time, even at these dark periods, when God didn't have faithful witnesses in a true church. We just never heard of them. After that, people realize how bad things are. Someone comes along at an early point named Francis of Assisi. I believe Francis of Assisi was a true believer. Crazy doctrines, putting ashes in his food and all this kind of stuff. He said he was married to Lady Poverty, the Bride of Christ, in reaction against the materialism of the church. One pope said, showing the papal treasury, we can no longer say, gold and silver have I none, but a, but a person said to him, who's a Roman Catholic saint, yes, but neither can we say, get up and walk. <laughs> Reacting against this, Francis of Assisi comes along, and he's the first major figure who tries to reform the Roman Catholic Church from within and fails. By going back to the love of Jesus, to a simple Christ-centered faith, caring for the poor, living simply, he's the first person who tries to change the Roman Catholic Church from within and fails. He affected people in his own lifetime, the Franciscans were noble, and they were persecuted by the other religious orders. It's a whole thing they don't want you to know, the fighting that went on between the religious orders. And one pope putting another pope on trial, and the anathemas, the rival popes, placed against each other. Nonetheless, Francis of Assisi tries. But then something happens. The Renaissance begins. And you're back to the old conflict between the Aristotelians and the Platonists. At this point, the main Platonist is Bonaventure. But the main Aristotelian is Aquinas. Now pay attention. The whole thing is happening in the Muslim world now. Judaism goes into a crisis. And someone called Rambam, Moses Maimonides from Spain, goes to North Africa and he writes something called A Guide for the Perplexed. He totally rewrites Judaism in Aristotelian terms. That's Rambam, Maimonides. The only thing Thomas Aquinas did was write a Christianized version of it called Summa Theologia. The entire worldview changed because of this avalanche of Aristotelianism that came from the Muslim world centered in Alexandria. Every time worldviews change, there are major changes in philosophy. We'll look at that next time and the time after. But, Rambam comes along and does it for Judaism. Somebody has to do it for Roman Catholicism. Now, the doctrine of transubstantiation, this eating food sacrificed to idols that Jesus is on about, it's already going on. But how do you explain it to people with an Aristotelian worldview? Aristotle had this idea of accidents and substance, hypostasis and accidents. Its accidents and its substance can be different. We've got Bert Jones. Bert Jones is Bert Jones. But the accidents of Bert Jones... Is he married or single? Does he have children? How much does he weigh? How much hair does he have? How many teeth in his head? The accidents surrounding him are mutable. They can change. But Bert Jones is Bert Jones. It's a crazy thing. But Thomas Aquinas comes along and says, 
In transubstantiation, the accidents don't change. It's Bert Jones that changes. <laughs> the bread and wine becomes Jesus, even though it still looks like bread and wine. You understand? It's a total Aristotelian idea. Absolutely crazy. No basis in science whatsoever. And as, as the Enlightenment came and science progressed, people knew it was ridiculous. But sempre eden. They can't change it. Ijtahad. They can't change it. Once it becomes part of the canon, it can't be changed. The Roman Catholic Church cannot change it. Babylon cannot be healed. Jeremiah says they'll be sacrificing cakes to the Queen of Heaven. That's what they do. The whole thing of Tammuz, the Madonna with the baby, that comes just from Tammuz worship, with which Ezekiel contended. Now another Scotus comes. This one is called Duns Scotus in 1265. He comes up with the idea of the Immaculate Conception. Mary had no sin in the year 1265. But it was not pro proclaimed an official doctrine until 1854 by Pi Pius IX. After him, the next figure was in 1324, William of Ockham. He taught blind faith. However, he did question the authority of the Pope to supersede Scripture. And that opened a door. Now, let's talk about what Jesus is getting at back in Revelation. He begins saying all these good things despite these abominations. I know your deeds, your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. True believers in the Roman Catholic Church who tried to change it from within. During the height of the Renaissance, there was a chap in Italy named Savonola. They killed him. He knew what the idolatry was from reading the Bible, but they killed him. He was a monk. I'm going to read you a list now. Let me read you a few doctrines of Roman Catholicism. Should we worship images we worship images of the saints and our Lord and kneel and pray before them? The Roman Catholic Church says yes, and I quote from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it is lawful to have images in the church and to give honor and worship unto them. Images are put in the churches that they must be worshipped. Therefore, those who do not worship these images are not true to the teachings of the church. Now again, the Hebrew word to worship, to bow down, to genuflect, to prostrate, it's all the same word. The hishtahavot, hishtakbayah. When you see someone kneeling before a graven image, they are committing an act of idolatry. Read the book of Ruth, or uh, the book of uh, Esther, or the book of Daniel. Can Mary, the priest, or the saints be our mediators? Turning to the Roman Catholic Bible, we find no. But turning to the Roman Catholic Church, we find yes, they're our mediators. It goes on and on. A total replacement for the original ideas of the New Testament. Second century, presbyters were first called priests by Lucian. Nicolaitanism. Sacerdotal mass instituted by Cyprian, the third century. Prayers for the dead, total abomination as of prayers to the dead, A.D. 300. The sign of the cross, A.D. 300. Wax candles, A.D. 320. The veneration of angels, dead saints, and images, A.D. 375. Mass becoming a daily ritual, A.D. 394. Beginning of the exaltation of Mary in the term Theotokos, Mother of God, first applied at the Council of Ephesus, A.D. 431. Priests wearing separate clothing to separate them from the common people, A.D. 500. Extreme unction, 526. The doctrine of purgatory, 593. Latin being used in worship, A.D. 600. Prayers offered to Mary as the official liturgy. Prayers offered to Mary, dead saints and angels, A.D. 600. The first man proclaimed to be Pope officially, Boniface III, A.D. 610. Kissing the Pope's feet, coming from emperor worship, A.D. 709. Temporal powers of popes conferred by Pepin, king of the Franks, A.D. 750. Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. He refused political power. Veneration of the cross images and relics authorized, A.D. 786. Holy water mixed with salt and chrism and blessed by a priest. Use of holy water, A.D. 850. The veneration of St. Joseph, 
A.D. 890. The College of Cardinals, A.D. 927. The Baptism of Bells, instituted by John XIII, A.D. 965. The Canonization of Dead Saints, by Pope John XV, A.D. 995. Fasting on Fridays in Lent, A.D. 998. The Mass developed as a sacrifice. Attendance was made obligatory, 11th century. The celibacy of priests declared, Doctrine of Demons, A.D. 1079. The Rosary, pagan origin, adopted by Peter the Hermit, A.D. 1090. The Inquisition, instituted by the Council of Verona, A.D. 1184. Use of violence and torture. The Sale of Indulgences, A.D. 1150. The Seven Sacraments, defined by Peter Lombard, the 12th century. Transubstantiation, defined by Innocent III, A.D. 1215. Auricular confession, that is the sacrament of penance, of sins to a priest instead of God, instituted by Innocent III, 1215. Adoration of the wafer, saying it's God, decreed by Pope Honorius III, A.D. 1220. The Bible forbidden to laymen, and the, place of, and, and, and the word of God placed on the index of forbidden books by the Council of Valencia, A.D. 1229. The scapular invented by Simon Stock of England, A.D. 1251. It's probably from Walthamstow. The cup forbidden to the laity at communion by the Council of Constance, A.D. 1414. Purgatory proclaimed as a dogma by the Council of Florence, A.D. 1439. Tradition declared equal authority with the Bible, Council of Trent, A.D. 1545. The apocryphal books added to the Bible, Council of Trent, A.D. 1546. The creed of Pope Pius IV in place of the original creed, A.D. 1560. The Immaculate Conception of Mary proclaimed by Pope Pius IX, A.D. 1854. The Syllabus of Errors proclaimed by Pope Pius IX and ratified by the Vatican Council, which condemned freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, speech, press, scientific discoveries, and authority of rulers, not approved by the Pope, A.D. 1864. The infallibility of the Pope in faith and morals, his infallibility, A.D. 1870. The Assumption of Mary, proclaimed by Pius XII, 1950. Mary proclaimed the mother of the Church, Pope Paul VI, 1965. And so it continues. Babylon cannot be healed. It can't be changed. 1492, Columbus discovers America. Genocide is used to steal the gold of the Incas and the Mayans and the Indians and bring it to Europe. The Pope proclaimed this year, commemorating the 500th anniversary of the arrival of the Gospel in South America. He tried to canonize inquisitors like Juniper Serra who tortured these Indians. But interestingly, this same Pope, John Paul II, visited a synagogue in Italy, and after 500 years, he admitted the Spanish Inquisition was a mistake. What's torturing and murdering half a million people? They used to have Jew inspectors and the whole bit. Yet, the same Pope, at the 500th anniversary of the Inquisition, 1992, tries to canonize Isabella, the very person on Romano who carried these things out with the connivance of the Church. Opus Dei, he's trying to canonize Jose Maria Escrive, a Nazi. Here's Monsignor Tiso, Roman Catholic Archbishop, personal friend of Hitler, who was the president of Nazi-occupied Slovakia. The first man to deport Jewish children to Auschwitz, they reckon 100,000. Tiso, when he was hung for his war crimes, they said, don't you know that you've killed tens of thousands of innocent people? He said, not people, Jews. He was never defrocked. Friend of the Pope, Friend of Hitler, pointed to a Nazi political position, deported at least 100,000 Jewish children to the ovens. The Roman Catholic clergy blessing Nazi emblems. The Pontifical Legate, Marsoni and Pavlovich, received the Nazi salute from a group of Ustasha Hitler youth, Heil Hitler, as the papal nuncio, the personal representative of Pius XII, giving the Heil Hitler salute. This whole thing in Yugoslavia goes back to this. There was a Holocaust committed by the Roman Catholic Church against the Serbs, and now we're seeing the repercussions of it. It was suppressed under Tito, but now it's the, it's, it's the result. This whole schism between the East and West goes back to 
the Greek-speaking Roman Empire in conflict with the Latin-speaking. And in the 1400s, I believe, the whole thing finally splits between the two. But Yugoslavia has been the traditional cutting edge of conflict between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. To this day, Heil Hitler, the Pope's representative, his little children. The Franciscan brother Filipovich, in his Ustasha uniform, is chief of the Jasinovac concentration camp. There he is. Let me read about the hierarchy. Cardinal Schmaus, who John the Twenty Third called the theologian of Munich, the Jesuit, he elevated him to a cardinal and promoted him. After it was well known that he was the author of the of the treatise called Empire and State, in which he said it is the obligation of German-speaking Roman Catholics to support Adolf Hitler, because the Third Reich unites German the German people with Catholic Christianity. That's Cardinal Schmaus the theologian of Munich. When did John the Twenty Third change his tune? After the Eichmann trials, when it was discovered that it was the Vatican and the monasteries that got all these Nazi war criminals to South America. Peron in Argentina, Gemeliel in Lebanon, Franco in Spain, Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, every one of these fascist re regimes was backed totally by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, every one of them. The German bishops made a treaty with Adolf Hitler in late 1930s that concordant with the blessings of Pope Pius XII. How did the Hitler come to power? Through an alliance, a coalition with the Zentrum, the Catholic Party of Bavaria, headed by the Privy Chamberlain, the Pope Pius XII. His name was Hans von Papen. So hence you have the Führer, Adolf Hitler, Führer of Germany, and Vice Führer, Hans von Papen. Vice Führer of the Third Reich, Deputy Führer to Adolf Hitler, and Privy Chamberlain to His Holiness Pope Pius XII. Sentenced at Nuremberg. Let me continue. The Bishop of Cardinal Inniger in Austria, Vienna. Interesting chap. He said, it is the obligation of Roman Catholics to support Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is the envoy of God. Heil Hitler. These are not ordinary priests. There were a lot of individual Catholics who didn't support this. But it was the hierarchy of the church. The hierarchy. Today, what are they doing? Trying to canonize Opus Dei founder, Jose Maria Escrive, a Nazi. What are they doing? Trying to canonize Isabella, who carried out the Inquisitions. They say they've changed. They can't change. Babylon cannot be healed. We talked about this when we did the woman at the well. Come out of her, my people. Revelation. Woe to you who are dwelling with the daughter of Babylon. Get out of her, lest you share in her sins and, and, and share in her, lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. Get out. You cannot practice Roman Catholicism without sinning. Now, there are sins of what Hebrew calls barut, ignorance. They can be sins without the people knowing it. But the Holy Spirit is, in Hebrew, haruaka kodesh, the spirit of holiness. He will never lead someone to sin. He won't do that. That's not how the Holy Spirit operates. When you see people saying, Roman Catholics should stay in their church, or the Holy Spirit led me to stay in the church, that's like saying the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness, led me to sin. When you bow down to an image, when you take the Roman Catholic transubstantiated Eucharist, you're eating food sacrificed to idols. You're committing immorality. Idolatry is sin. You can't be a Roman Catholic without taking the Eucharist. Not only that, but it's a different gospel. They teach that salvation comes to the sacraments administered by their priests, not through being born again. I can show you in their own catechisms. In fact, they did it on the John 4 tape. Which gospel are you going to believe? Praying to the dead is a sacrilegious abomination. You cannot practice this religion without sinning. They think they're going to change it? Well, let me tell you something. If Francis of Assisi couldn't change the Roman Catholic Church, these people today aren't going to change it. If Vincent de Paul couldn't change the Roman Catholic Church from within, they're not going to change it either. If Erasmus of Rotterdam couldn't change the Roman Catholic Church from within, they're not going to do it either. 
For all their faults and mistakes, Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, they were not simply Roman Catholic clergy. They were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. They didn't begin by the Reformation. They began by trying to change it from within. If Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli couldn't change it from within, these people aren't either. They think they're greater than Francis of Assisi or Vincent de Paul. These were people who really loved Jesus. They tried. They tried. They meant well. But they had a big problem. That problem was this. Babylon cannot be healed. This is what this church has always done. It's what this church did a thousand years ago. It's what it did 500 years ago. It's what it did 50 years ago. It's what it's doing today. It's what it's going to do again. This church has never done anything but murder Jews and Bible-believing Christians. The two kinds of people the New Testament calls God's chosen are Jews and born-again Christians. Who do they try to kill? Look at their history. Go back to Jeremiah 31, 31. I will make a new covenant with who? With the Baptists? With the Pentecostals? No, I'll make the new covenant the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant was made with Israel and the Jews. They can't have that. And they can't have you either. Babylon cannot be healed. Come out of her, my people. God bless you and thank you.